Hey everyone, it's Lindsay, and thanks for tuning in to First Aid Express. Today, we are talking the talk and walking the walk with lower extremity ulcers. With an aging population and an alarmingly high rate of smoking, obesity, and diabetes, these three ulcer types that we will discuss are ones that you will be sure to encounter in the hospital and in the clinic. There are subtle and not so subtle differences between the three, and I'm here to help you differentiate them. Let's get walking and talking through this express fact. Today, we have one objective that applies to all three kinds of ulcers. To describe the etiology, pathogenesis, appearance, and associated features of venous, arterial, and neuropathic ulcers. First up, we have the most common type of ulcer, the venous ulcer. These are due to venous stasis and insufficiency from many different causes. These causes include poor muscle pump function, incompetent valves, or venous thrombosis all leading to elevated venous pressure and subsequently hypertension in our lower extremities. This then leads to inflammation, fibrosis, and tissue breakdown, predisposing patients to ulceration. And when these changes persist and progress, it's termed chronic venous insufficiency, which predisposes patients to a spectrum of problems, ranging from asymptomatic cosmetic varicose veins and telangiectasias to more severe presentations like edema, stasis dermatitis, and possibly ulceration. So when we encounter patients with chronic venous disease, what can we expect to see in terms of ulcers? Venous ulcers are frequently irregularly shaped, shallow, and exudative. They have intact sensation and are mildly to moderately painful. There's a complex grading system for ulcers, but that's beyond the scope of step one. Because gravity has a tendency to weigh everything down, venous ulcers are most likely to form in our lower extremities, specifically the ankle to mid-calf. A common location to find these venous ulcers is over the medial malleolus, and more so because of incompetent valves, insufficient veins, and pathological changes to tissues secondary to disease, the lower leg is the most common place for edema and therefore ulcers to form. Moving to the other side of the vascular system, we have arterial ulcers. These ulcers arise secondary to the many disease processes leading to arterial insufficiency and reduced blood flow otherwise known as peripheral artery disease. So it makes sense that these ulcers present with other symptoms of poor arterial flow, like weak or even absent pulses, on cold and pale extremities, on a background of atrophic skin without hair. After all, if there isn't any arterial blood supply, there's no way to deliver much-needed nutrition to keep tissue healthy, leading to gradual breakdown. And when we hear a person with existing peripheral artery disease has an ulcer, what should we expect? Arterial ulcers are often symmetric and have a punched out appearance. These ulcers start out as minor wounds that fail to heal because of insufficient blood supply. And they are often found on pressure points like the distal toes that we see to the left, anterior shins, or other bony prominences. And lastly, peripheral artery disease often comes with severe pain, whether it's on exertion or at rest, or diffuse severe pain due to ischemia. Therefore, arterial ulcers are very painful. And finally, we reach our third and last ulcer type, the neuropathic ulcer, which is due to peripheral neuropathy. With over 400 million people living with diabetes and about 30% of those having peripheral neuropathy, this is another very common type of ulcer that you'll encounter. Because neuropathy leads to loss of sensation, individuals cannot sense pain associated with pathological tissue pressures. It's thought that a combination of pressure, friction, shearing, and vascular changes contribute to the formation of these ulcers. Exceeding arteriolar pressures of 32 millimeters of mercury will prevent perfusion, and up to two hours of excessive pressures can cause irreversible tissue injury, with ulcers forming at even higher pressures. A few fun facts. Sitting puts your ischial tuberosities under 300 millimeters of mercury of pressure, and simply lying down generates 150. Thus, it makes sense that patients with limited mobility should be turned every two hours to prevent sacral ulcers that we see to the bottom right. Knowing these fun facts, you might want to listen to your fitness device when it bugs you to stand up and walk around during those long study sessions. But getting back to our topic of neuropathic ulcers. Patients with these ulcers also have other pathological signs of nerve damage, including absent or diminished reflexes, flautos, and Charcot joints, which is a particularly severe deformation due to lack of sensation as well as joint degeneration. Now, what do we expect to see when examining these ulcers? Let's look at the foot we see to the right. We will see hyperkeratotic edges and undermined borders on bony pressure points. 
With neuropathic ulcers, most of the damage is deep, which predisposes patients to osteomyelitis. This is why you will always check to see if these wounds extend to the bone with a probe. And I suppose the only upside to this ulcer type, which is one of the contributing factors, is that they have no feeling and are painless. Because the nerves are defective, there's no pain sensation or a signal to our body to move around and adjust to prevent tissue damage. I guess that's a silver lining. But great job sticking with me through our three different ulcer types. Let's check in with a quick flash quiz. Okay, you see a patient in the clinic with an ulcer that's described as irregular, shallow, located on the left mid-calf, and is moderately painful. And the patient has bilateral edema in their legs. What kind of ulcer is it? A venous ulcer. Remember, venous ulcers are the most common type of ulcers. Chronic venous insufficiency and its related sequelae is very common, so naturally, venous ulcers are too. Remember that we covered three types of ulcers today, venous, arterial, and neuropathic, which can be differentiated by their underlying etiologies, pathogenesis, and associated signs and pain. Be sure to check out the table comparing them by each of their characteristics in your musculoskeletal chapter in first aid. And when reading question stems or chart checking your patients, take note of their past medical history, as that can clue you into what type of ulcer they might have. If it's in a question stem, there's usually a reason. Again, my name is Lindsay, and it's been a joy walking you through First Aid's musculoskeletal chapter. If you thought this video was helpful, throw a thumbs up down below. I'll see you back here for more First Aid Express videos. Good luck and happy studying.